Water Lawn. Our guest speaker is Cynthia uh, Solid, who is one of uh, Wake County's master gardeners. Very lucky to have her here today. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, I just want to start with taking a little survey of how many people know what kind of lawn, but you have a warm and cool season grass. Okay, and how many have cool season grasses? Warm season grasses? And how many don't know? All right. Weeds. And weeds, yes. Weeds. Okay. Awesome. 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 okay. So um, we're going to talk a little bit about lawns today, and I'm going to give you some information about how to take care of your lawn, how to select grass species that might be best for you, a about fertilization. Yes, question. Yeah. I is any of this going to be included as a handout or anything, or should we take that? Or I don't it? have a handout. Okay. So you can take notes. Um, I don't. I think they said they'll be available online. Okay. And I can make the slides available. Okay. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about fertilization, which requires a little bit of math. Um, steps for healthy maintenance while protecting the environment. Lawns are pretty chemically intensive. And so we have to make sure that we do the right thing for the environment while we're having a nice lawn. And then I'll give you some sources for additional information. So I just want to start a little bit with the history of lawns. Why do we have lawns? What made them so popular? Basically, it was a European invention. They actually have a better climate for lawns than we do. Uh, the first grassland started in the Middle Ages uh, where they had castles and they wanted to be able to see any approaching enemies. And so they had big meadows around the castles. And there were also big meadows for the villagers. And these were maintained by having raising animals. So that was, was how they maintained them. Then in the late teen, uh, let's see, it became a status symbol in the 17th century very wealthy landowners be, um, were able to hire a lot of physical labor to use sides to cut down the grass, and that's how they kept them maintained. So it became a status symbol of wealth. If you were able to have a lawn, it meant you were very wealthy. That same attitude was brought over to the New World when settlers came here, so still only the very wealthy had lawns. In the late 1800s, a lot of Scottish um, immigrants came, and they brought along uh, these new sports, bowling and golf, which needed large expanses of turf. And so that kind of brought a new attitude about lawns. And then what really changed is the invention of the lawnmower. And then in the 1950s, that's how recent it was, where it really became the American ideal to have a lawn. Back in the 1950s, uh, soldiers returning from World War II needed new housing. There were other new developments with the lawnmower because of the Industrial Revolution. They invented the rotary mower, and there were also advances in pest control. And these new housing developments, um, Levittown, I don't know if you've heard the history about that, was this huge development with little tract housing with everybody had an individual green lawn. And that's what started the American dream of owning a home and having a lawn. That history is actually pretty recent. Well, why do we still have lawns today? Well, some of that psychology ca uh, has carried over and we're interested in having lawns as part of the American dream of owning a home. We think they bring beauty to our, our yards, they provide recreational space, and they can increase your home value. Certainly having a dirt lot doesn't do anything. So what can lawn, lawns bring as benefits? Well, they can reduce surface uh, runoff, filter water before reaching water supplies, reduce the surface temperature, produce oxygen trapped dust, control erosion. So all these benefits can come from lawns. But I do want to mention that these environmental benefits are the same with any plant. So if you have other plantings, they're going to do this. So this is not unique to lawns. This is just having a lawn as compared to having a dirt lawn. Now, as was mentioned earlier, we are in a transition zone. It, really, the entire state of North Carolina is a transition zone, with the western area being slightly favorable, more favorable for cooler grasses, and the coastal plain slightly more favorable for warm season grasses. However, in the Piedmont area, we are a very, very transitional zone. The good news is you can kind of grow warm season or cool season. The bad news is, is none of these grasses really excel in this area. So you have to make other considerations when you're trying
trying to decide whether you want to pull over one of these or not. So you want to look at how are you going to use this? You're going to have a high traffic area? Are your kids going to be playing sports in the lawn or have a dog running around? You want to have a lawn that's going to stand up to a lot of traffic. What's your appearance level? Do you want a lawn that looks sort of green all year round, or do you not care if it looks brown in the winter but looks really great in the summer? And then other environmental factors that might be particular to your particular yard, whether you have uh, what lighting or shade or, or bright sun, <coughs> high or low, all these other things come into play. <coughs> so as I mentioned, there are cool season and warm season grasses. Okay, so um, the cool season, obviously, they're going to grow best during the cooler temperatures during spring and fall, but they actually have a pretty long growth cycle. They're going to be green from towards the end of February through to the end of June or so, and then they green up again in September or through the end of November. The warm season grasses, on the other hand, go completely dormant in the winter, but they will look really great from May until October. So. Um, in addition, the types of um, conditions that some of the, if you have like a, a north facing slope or light shade, some of the cool season grasses may do better than some of the warmer season grasses. The cool season grasses include tall fescue, which is most popular in this area for cool season grasses or mixed with Kentucky <coughs> bluegrass, and there are other ones, fine fescue and rye grass. The warm season grasses include Bermuda, Zoysia, St. Augustine, and Centipede. Now, I just put this up here so that you can just have a comparison of some of the most popular grasses of what the differences are. Tall fescue is going to be something that grows a little bit taller and have mowing height of three to four inches compared to Zoysia or Bermuda, which is mowed very low, one to two inches. Tall fescue has a wider blade, it has a darker green color, and it's green all year long, in you know, including in winter. Whereas the warm season grasses have a more narrow blade, the color is slightly uh, lighter, which is a medium dark green and you know, gray green, and they are going to look beige or brown in the winter time. This graph uh, table I just put up here just so you can see some of the different characteristics of different grasses that are popular in our area. Um, some of them can be seeded, some of them need to be put in by plugs. There are differences in drought tolerance, heat and cold tolerance, as well as what your preferred season is, texture, uh, how often they need to be mowed, and how easy they are to establish. There's lots of differences between all these different grass seasons. And what do the numbers mean? High is good, low High is good? High is good, yes, low is not good. Um, and where you can find out a lot of this information if you have trouble selecting the grass is I suggest that you look at this website called Turf Files. It's put out by NC State. Turffiles.ncsu.edu is a great site. It has tons and tons of information about grass. It has uh, descriptions and pictures of all the different kinds of grasses you can grow. It tells you what their characteristics are tells you all about weeds and diseases, everything you want to know about turf. They also have this little selection tool on their website. It, I wouldn't say it's the greatest thing, but if you have no idea what kind of grass you want, you can try it out. It has you put in some of your preferences, where you're located, and it will give you suggestions for what type of grass would do good in your situation. The, the slide you had before this, could you put it back up for just a second? Certainly. I'm going to take this screen. Mm-hmm. Okay, so... Thank you. Uh -huh. All right, so when is the best time to establish a new lawn? So the information will tell you that establishing a new lawn and renovating a lawn um, are very similar. So this information applies pretty much to both. Obviously for pool season grasses, you're going to put them in late in the, in the fall, in the, early in the fall, but late in the summer, um, from late August to October, so that they are able to establish roots over the winter, so that during the time when they grow best, they're able to get really well established. Warm season grasses obviously are the opposite. They're going to be planted in May through July. For any site that you need to plant grass, 
you must have contact with the soil. So you want to remove disease debris, you want to make sure you get rid of all existing vegetation, and otherwise prepare and grade the area so that when you do put out the plants or the seeds, that the, the um, grass is not competing with anything and that it is in contact with the soil that you're seeding. We do recommend you get soil tests. Um, this is good because it will tell you whether you need to alter the pH. We do tend to have acid, acid pH in this area, but the soil test will tell you specifically how much lime you might need to add. And it will also tell you about the nutrient requirements. And if you ever buy a bag of fertilizer, which Deb will I'm sure you do, you know that it always has three letters, N, P, and K. It stands for nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And these are the main nutrients that are needed for any plant to grow. And if you get the soil test done, it will tell you which nutrients you need the most of or the least of. And we recommend you then buy the right fertilizer for that situation. And one of the reasons for this is we don't want to be putting out excess fertilizer when it's not necessary. Phosphorus can be a water pollutant, and we don't want excess phosphorus running into the environment. Yeah. I've, I've had some soil tests done, and I, the, it recommended that I put in 5105, and I, I really can't find it anywhere. Where do you find that? Yes, and I have found that a lot of the stores do not carry <laughs> the right formulations. And that's interesting that you have, uh, that the, your, your soil is calling for more phosphorus. Um, you might check more of a specialty nursery rather than um, one of the big box stores to see if they carry more specialty <coughs> formulas. Um, in general, um, as, and, not, and in general, we do have certain types that we recommend that can be valuable. Um, and, and what those are also ratios that you want. And so you're just going to want to look for something that has a slightly higher phosphorus number, even if the numbers aren't exact. Um, when you do collect a soil sample, you want to um, get, you can get your kits at either the Reed Creek Road office where the soil testing is done, or at the Wake County Extension Center. You can go online and it will tell you all the instructions you need to where to find these. And when you get a kit, it will tell you all the instructions you need to know for collecting the sample. Um, if you have uniform soil throughout your yard, you only need one sample box. You want to take it from a few different areas, but you only need to do one box. If you have areas with lots of different types of soil, you might want to get multiple samples to have them analyzed. You want to fertilize before you put in your new lawn. Um, and we do recommend that if you're not able to get a soil test done, that a general uh, formulation would be one in a ratio of 412 or 413 for this area for the growing turf. <laughs> so that means that's the ratio. You're not going to find necessarily find one that says 412 for NK. You might find one that says 8. Two, four, or 16, four, eight. So what you want to do is, here's where the math comes in, is you look at that first number on the bag. That's the amount of nitrogen. You always want to apply one pound of nitrogen per 1,000 square feet. So you need to estimate the size of your lawn, to calculate the width and the depth, and multiply it out, figure out approximately how many thousand square feet is your lawn. Then you're going to take 100 and divide that first number into 100. So the example here shows that we've got a 1648 formula. 100 divided by 16 is 6.25. That means you need six and a quarter pounds of fertilizer per 1,000 square feet. So if your lawn is 2,000 square feet, you're going to need 12 and a half pounds. So if you buy a 10-pound bag, you don't have enough. But if your lawn is 1,000 square feet, you're going to have more than enough. So you need to kind of figure out how big is your yard and how much to apply. If you buy a bag that starts with the number 25, you're going to divide 100 by 25, and you're only going to need 4 pounds per 1,000 square feet. After you've planted about 6 or 8 weeks, it may be time to fertilize again. You want to use a rotary or drop type spreader or um, make sure you get uniform coverage. And 
if you're planting a vegetative lawn, such as goja, you can uh, fertilize that throughout the season to encourage faster spread so that it gets better established. Again, when to plant, March to July for warm season and mid-August to September for cool season grasses. Now, we've had kind of a rough winter this year with lots of rain, so lots of our yards are kind of muddy. There's areas where we may have lost some of your turf. Do I have to wait till fall to be able to plant it? Well, not necessarily. You can go ahead and reseed now. In fact, now is probably a good time to do it. But just know that you'll probably need to redo it again in the fall. But if you want to fill in bare spots now, it's okay to put out some grass. Just know that it's not going to establish as well for the season at this time of year. All right, so there are different ways to plant. Seeding is the most uh, cost effective, but there is vegetative plant planting where you can have sod put out, or space planting where you put in plugs. Once you put in that new lawn, you do need to water it. And generally, when it's brand new, you only need to make sure you get the first couple inches of soil moist. And make sure, again, that that's, if you do the seed, that it has contact with the soil. Then after it's been established, then is when you need to water it less frequently, but more deeply. You want to make sure that you get to a depth of about six to eight inches. That does not mean you put six to eight inches of water out. It means you put about, about an inch of water, which will then penetrate down in that soil about six to eight inches. Uh, you want to mow the grass when it gets to be 50% higher than your desired height. And generally new lawns are not uh, pro don't have problems with pests as much, so you don't really have to worry about that when you've got a brand new lawn. Do you always need to keep watering once you've established your lawn? Well, if you've got sandy soils, yes, because that soil does not hold moisture, and if you want to maintain the lawn, you are going to need to water it frequently. However, uh, most of us in the Piedmont have mostly clay soil, and these soils hold a lot of water, and depending on what kind of grass you have, a lot of grass is really drought tolerant once it's established. For example, tall fescue can grow for three or four weeks without any water. It may start to go dormant, but it won't actually kill the lawn. So if we have a long period without rain, you don't necessarily need to water it every week. You can wait. And if we don't have water, then you might give it a, a, a good watering, a good soaking to keep it going. But you don't need to water it all. A good way to know how much water you put out is to use uh, some kind of rain gauge um, or a tuna can is a good measure for inches. Put it out when you've got your sprinklers and when that can fills up, you know you put out a good deep water. You might want to wait until you actually see drought symptoms. Um, they would be curling of leaves. You can see footprints on the lawn and um, wilting or off color. That would tell you probably it's time. Again, I already said um, you want to measure it to make sure that you get a depth of six to eight inches, which means a about an inch of uh, surface water. When to water is also important. You don't want to water late in the afternoon. Uh, sometimes that's the only opportunity you may have. But what that does is it doesn't allow the black grass blades to dry out, and so they stay wet for a longer period of time. And that be, can be very conducive for the spread of a lot of fungal diseases of plants. And so it's best to water early in the morning. Um, my background is in plant pathology, so I have to show the requisite uh, disease slide of grass. And uh, this is a particular disease that is pretty prevalent in our area. It's caused by a fungus called Rhizoctonia. And this particular fungus uh, can affect many types of grasses. There are some diseases that are specific to different types of host grasses. There are about 100 different diseases that affect grass, um, turf grass. About 25 of those are more common. And as I said, this is one of the most common ones. As you can see, the symptoms look different on uh, the different types of grass. Again, I would send you to first look at the Turf Files website to 
to look and see if you might be able to identify what problem you have. And if you really need help, you can get a sample diagnosed at either the NC State Turf um, Diagnostics Lab or the NC State Plant Disease Clinic. Uh, both of these may charge fees. There's lots of information on their websites about how to submit a sample. Mowing is, ex yes? Are there certain conditions that uh, would make you more susceptible to getting those two fun Yes, absolutely. Over fertilization can increase your susceptibility to getting uh, diseases. And again, the watering situation, which you don't always have control of when you have all this rain and stuff, but especially in the spring and towards the summer when we start to get a lot of uh, rain, heavy rains, and the temperature is right, that can also lead to conditions. Other air things that might be stressing your lawn can lead to more disease. Um, <clears throat> as I said, mowing is very important. Uh, you want to keep the mower's blades sharp and you want to mow at the proper height for the type of grass that you have. We recommend leaving the clippings on the lawn. They can add a lot of benefits back to the grass. They add a lot of nutrients. However, if you're not able to mow in a timely fashion and the grass has gotten too long, then it is best to remove the clippings. If you leave clumps of wet grass clippings on the lawn, that can cause problems with, with again, um, increasing uh, disease spread. So a mulching mower blade is a mulching mower blade is a good idea. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I don't know. The, yeah, you don't really need anything special. Because it, it just chops it. Yeah, it just chopping it up small. Helpful. You do want to keep your blade sharp um, and balanced. This is good for a number of reasons. Uh, one is it'll give you a nice clean cut. It'll make the lawn actually look nicer. If you have ragged cuts, the edges turn kind of brown and kind of gives an off color to the lawn. It can also increase the surface area for disease organisms to get into the grass. And um, it will actually extend the life of your mower to make it easier for you to, to mow. By pushing that mower faster, you're going to use less gas and cause less pollution. Again, mowing at the proper height is important. Um, you want to, again, cut when you have about 50% more than what you need. And uh, you might want to raise it during the winter, I uh, mean, during a rainy uh, spell, and you do not, do not want to mow when the grass is wet. As I mentioned, the leaf clippings are great to leave on the lawn. They will add back about 20 to 30% of nutrients that you wouldn't have to add back in the fertilizer. They do not contribute to, fat, to thatch development. A lot of people think, oops, me, um, think that that's the case, but that occurs either from over-fertilizing or from scalping when you mow much too close, and that can cause damage to the, the, the grass plants in that case of thatch development. Um, again, if you have to delay mowing, you want to remove those clippings. It also helps to remove any weed seeds. If the, the weed seeds, if you do have any weeds in your lawn that are growing along with the grass, the long, longer you go between mowing, the more chance those weeds have to go to seed. And so if they are at seed and you mow and leave those clippings on the ground, you're going to get more weeds. So that's another reason to bag if you have to delay mowing. Uh, when to fertilize. That's going to differ for each different type of grass that you have. The Turf Files website, as well as, as extension publications, which actually that's where these publications come from, has links to publications for each type of grass and tells you exactly when to fertilize and what kind of fertilizer to put out. So that's really a great source for additional information for your specific type of lawn that you might have. Other issues, uh, mentioned lime earlier, that's to deal with acidity. It's best to put out lime really this time of year or earlier because the freezing and thawing of the ground helps that lime to get into the soil. The compaction is a big issue. The best way to deal with that is to rent an aerator, one of those big clunky machines. Um, a lot of times neighborhoods might go in together and take turns using it, rent it for a day. These little uh, spiky shoes do not aerate your lawn. Mm -hmm. However, they can get rid of grubs. Um, they can be used for that. 
Um, Why do you put the lime on? The lime is to reduce the acidity, and grass grows best at a neutral acidity. <clears throat> So um, that's the reason for the line. Again, if you're not sure, you might want to get a soil test to see what your soil is like. And pine trees, if you have pine trees, that... It can, but they, they've done some new studies that show that the pines themselves do not, the, the mulch does not really affect the soil that drastically. Yeah. How do the spikes get rid of gloves? <laughs> I guess they're, they're not, if they're at the surface level, they'll poke right through them and kill them. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, it doesn't work for aeration. Execution. Yeah, yeah. So um, the other a tool you can rent if you do have a thatch problem is a power rake for um, for uh, for vertigo. All right, turf is going to deteriorate over time unless you're putting tons of chemicals out. You don't really want to do that. There's there's lots of reasons for turf decline, and so when it does, then you want to turn to fixing it. And basically, what you're going to do is many of the same steps you do when you renovate a new home. You're going to follow the same schedule for cool or warm season grasses. And you're going to want to look at other problems you might have. So if you have a weed problem, you might want to do hand weeding. And it's best to do that if the weeds are young. If you've got a real bad problem, you may need to break out the herbicides. And of course, you're going to want to reseed. If you do need to reseed, you need to make sure that you have bare soil. Throwing your seed out on top of thatch and on top of weeds is not going to make you a nice lawn. You're just throwing them out your money. So you need to prepare for seeds. You need to remove any weeds or um, excess vegetation. You want to put down your fertilizer in line and prepare a good seed bed. Uh, once you've done that, again, you're going to have to do that maintenance to get that part of the lawn established. So that's going to involve light waterings until it's established, and then you'll want to go more deeper with the waterings. Of course, you want to limit traffic while that new grass is getting established. What about putting straw or something on top of the seed? Straw is very helpful. What that does is it helps to um, maintain the moisture level so it doesn't dry out as fast. Because the straw absorbs water. Yeah, well, it keeps it from evaporating oh, as much. Okay. Yes, and so that will keep it moist. So that, that's very helpful to do that. And I also think it helps, um, depending on what CGI, uh, birds sometimes go after the seeds or hide the seeds from the birds as well. All right, so I did mention I want to bring your attention to caring for the environment. I think that's important um, when we're doing our lawns because they can be very chemical intensive with lots of different pesticides that are used, with the fertilizers. We want to make sure we don't have fertilizer runoff into our streams. We don't want to use excess pesticides. So you want to adapt what they call an integrated pest management approach. That means you're going to plant the best grass that you can for your situation, watering and mowing and fertilizing it properly according to the information I provided that you can get online. When you use pesticide, you want to select the safest pesticide possible for the situation by that first. And you want to always, always follow label recommendations. Yes? The reason I'm here is selecting you know, the, for the environment. How can I, because I'm tired of just putting everything down. So are you going to expand on what are the safest, effective pesticides? It is going to well, it, it's going to depend on what particular problem you have. Yeah. And for herbicides, yeah. there's different weeds that, that you can do different types of pesticides. Uh, what I would recommend for that is if you have specific problems, to call the Master Gardener office and tell them specifically what issue you have, and they can look in the Ag Chemicals Manual and make a specific <coughs> recommendation for you. The other thing you want to do, and I'll get to this in a second, is you don't want to apply really willy-nilly pesticides. You want to only apply where it's really needed. You want to attack the problem when it first starts. If you wait, the problem gets worse, you're going to need more product to put out. So those are some of the things that you can do to minimize how much chemical you put on your lawn. Uh, again, applying when the pests are most susceptible. When the weeds are young, they're easy to control. When they start getting really entrenched, they're harder to pull, they're harder to 
What so kind of pests are we talking about? We're talking about weeds, we're talking about plant diseases. So all, all these different things, you can also have some insect growth problems. Well, I, I, actually, I'm more interested in the grow, I mean, all of it. I have it all. I have all those problems. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. When I think pesticides, I think animals, critters. No, no. Pesticides is a general term that includes herbicides, fungicides, bactericides. Okay. So pesticides is a general term. All right. Excuse me. Yes. So, so you mentioned you can call where you get information. You can call the master gardener office. I'll have that information at the Cause, end. Because I need some mojo for Japanese stillgrass. Oh, oh yes. yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, that is um, short, short of a flamethrower. Yes, yeah. yes. That is a, a huge problem in this area. Huge. One thing that you can do is to put out pre-emergent and to do that um, not sure the exact time, but pretty soon to put out pre-emergent and put out for your crab gas, you can put that out for the Japanese steel press where you've had it before, and that will help to prevent prevent that from germinating. It's, it's a problem you really need to keep on top of. It's very <laughs> difficult. I went like two or three years. Yeah, they haven't it, come up with it's a everywhere. <laughs> they haven't everywhere. come up with it is, and it hasn't come up with a single solution yet. But that is one thing you can try. Pre-emergent. Um, again, um, to minimize how much um, different herbicides or things you're putting out, only treat those areas where you know you have a problem. <clears throat> you want to learn to tolerate some weeds. Uh, not all weeds with Japanese stillgrass is the exception <laughs> it's evil, but other weeds really aren't so bad. Um, for example, dandelions um, can attract pollinators such as butterflies and bees. They help diversify your lawn. We all want a nice diversified population of insects and birds and things and having um, different plants can assist with that. And but that's only if you don't mow and you let them bloom. No, no, no. Well, you let them bloom, but you get them before they go to seed. Oh. Okay? okay. Get them before they go to seed. Um, but they, the tap roots can actually help break up your soil. So it makes the soil, helps condition the soil. So you might let them grow for a little while and dig them up. So they've done their, done their job. Clover is good for honeybees, and clover also has um, nitrogen association with nitrogen fixing bacteria, so that it adds nitrogen back to your soil, so that can reduce your need for fertilizer. And I'll mention in a moment that there, there are actually other different special kinds of clover you can buy for your lawn. Is there, can you use a, can you have a, a clove lawn? A clover lawn? Yeah, some people do. Yeah, I've heard of it. yeah, yeah. They, they, they have these special mini clovers. Just don't barefoot. That's right. Bees. It's the bees. Oh, <laughs> yep. Okay. So um, again, uh, controlling weeds by hand if necessary. Um, to reduce herbicide use and only using them herbicides when they're needed. Okay. Here's about the, the mini clovers. Um, these are newly some new varieties that have been bred. They're much smaller than the regular clover you see around. You can use them. It by themselves or in a mix with uh, fescue grass or other grass. So um, that's an option. Other options include dwarf manda grass, uh, native ground covers, moss, and we mentioned moss earlier. Yes? Um, I assume the clovers require sunshine or do they grow? Yeah, it? I think they do. And, and so this is the thing where, where a lot of these things, like I was going to say with the moss, moss grows great in the shade. There are areas where you just cannot grow grass. No matter how hard you try, you cannot grow grass under a big oak tree. You cannot grow grass in lots of places where it's super shady. You can buy shade blends, but they, they really um, struggle. And so that's where you might want to consider having some of these alternatives in your yard for parts of your yard. Um, whoops. Do you have um, pictures of clover? I do not have a picture. I'm sure you can find some on this. What is like? This, oh, this, this plant right here, this is called Green and Gold or Chrysogenum virginianum. This is a native uh, ground cover that can be used. Some people use that. It's low growing. People use creeping sedums. There are some other plants um, that I like for parts of my yard. Um, I use Mazus and Veronica. Um, and these are real, have real pretty blue flowers in the spring. 
Now, a lot of the uh, ground covers are not going to stand up to the traffic. They're not going to stand walking over. But a solution to that is to put in a pathway, and then you can walk through them without damaging them. And you can use a combination of these techniques as well to reduce the amount of grass you have. I like to look at grass as a frame for, for looking at the rest of my yard rather than the focal point of my yard. So a little bit of grass and then having a lot of these other things. Making sure that in areas where grass is not going to grow, like the shade, to use an alternative like moss, which, which really looks lovely. It's green and you don't have to do anything to maintain it. Um, where do I get my moss seeds? Um, generally, or do you just sit there and hope that the moss grows? You kind of have to hope, but generally it'll show up on its own. Um, and where you can, what you can do is you can, if you find some moss, it usually grows in very moist areas. You can, um, and I don't know the exact formula, but you can can make a, you can take moss that you have, put it in a blender with I don't remember what the other milk. with milk, is that butter milk, butter milk. Butter milk. And then you can spray it out on your lawn, and it will establish. So that, that's why I'm sure there are exact recipes on the, on the internet for doing that. Um, one other thing I did think of that I do want to mention when you're putting out herbicides is herbicides can affect your trees. So if you have tree roots growing in an area, you do not want to put out a large amount of herbicide that will affect the trees growing. Those roots suck up that herbicide. I wanted to make sure that you knew about that. So um, here's some more references I do want to mention. We do have a publication that's the general publication for all lawns of Carolina Lawns, a guide to maintaining quality turf in the landscape. This is available online if you go to Turf Files. You can also call the Master Gardener office and. There are, as I said, if you know what specific type of grass you have, you can also go to turf files and get publications on that specific type of grass that you have. And it will give you a, a schedule of when to fertilize, how to mow it, and all the other particulars for your particular uh, type of grass. So that's all I have for you today. I'm happy to answer any additional questions. We had a lady who spoke to us at the uh on Thursday night lectures. Mm -hmm. I think her name is Moss Annie, but I have her website, Moss Annie. Okay, I don't know. And she's a source somewhere looking for mosses. Okay, so people hear that Moss Annie, look up the website if you want to get mosses. Yes. I'm sorry, <clears throat> Moss Annie is the name of the website? I believe that, I believe that's correct. Uh, okay. Chris, do you remember? Well, I didn't attend it, but that's what she goes by. I would just do a search, whether her domain name is that or not. We'll probably still find her. Search for Moss Annie if you're looking for a source of moss. Yeah, you never talked about really. What about Roundup? Well, Roundup is a broad spectrum herbicide. My opinion about Roundup is that it's pretty safe compared to many other herbicides <coughs> that are more toxic. But if you put that on your lawn, you're going to kill it. You're going to kill it. I'm talking. We're talking still grass back here. Oh, for it's still grass. Right. Yes. Because I, I only have a small area. The problem, the problem with still grass, the problem with still grass, and still grass is an annual, okay? So you have to get it before it goes to seed. Once it goes to seed, that seed can last in the ground for seven years or longer. Oh, yeah. And so you think uh, you got rid of it, and then all of a sudden it's bad. Or your neighbor has, and they haven't done anything. It's, it's spread around. And the, the other issue is that if, if you keep it mowed, it yes. just makes seeds lower down. Yeah. And so so that, that doesn't necessarily solve the problem. Right. Okay. And so sometimes Correct. you might want to let it grow high and then cut it. I think they found that if you let it grow and cut it um, towards the end of the season before it goes to seed, that that's one way. But, you know, I think the best I've heard is trying to use a pre-emergent yeah. or pulling it by hand. Or getting rid of the whole area. <laughs> but yeah. that's not going to kill the seeds. It never showed up until there was like one kid who was mowing everyone's lawn on the street. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Then, you think he spread it around? <laughs> Possible. Possible. Well, it um, makes no more I, I've, I have a lot of problems with still grass too. And um, one of you mentioned flamethrower and you were joking, yeah. but actually it's a really, really good <laughs> control for still grass because if you've got a perennial grass, uh, the flamethrower is not going to kill your perennial grass. It'll knock it back a little bit, but the stilt grass won't regrow. 
You'll also fry the still grass seeds that are in the soil, but your perennial grass will come back. I found this out. I, I, I have a large uh, area, quote unquote natural area, what people call them, but they're unnatural natural areas, right? right. Because natural is not a big open area, right? But it was constantly growing chickweed in the winter and still grass in the summer, and I was tired of hand weeding and I didn't want to use Roundup, which was very effective, but I started using the flamethrower, much more effective than the Roundup or hand weeding or anything because I'm killing the seeds, and so it doesn't come back. And so I had the flamethrower, and I thought saw some patches in the lawn. Uh, well, what have I got to lose? The lawn is horrible anyway. You know? like the okay, lawn so here's a recommendation. I don't know if that's an official recommendation. I may need to warn the neighbors, uh, but other than that. No, you only do it after a heavy rain. Is it yeah. not, are you getting a lot of long leaf pine trees growing here? Yeah. Not a lot of long leaf pine seeds. You know, there's no long leaf pines in the yard to go to seed. But no, it, it so those pine needles will go up like that. Yeah, yeah. That's only, mean, you yeah, only, that's why you just be careful. Yeah, it is, you that. only do it after a heavy rain. I have a two part question about pest control. Uh, so, dogs come into this urban uh, yard and they leave these yellow spots on the, on the grass to uh, remedy that. You have to put like grass seed, like new uh, potting soil and grass seed on it. it is, and the other thing would be uh, if you had something to uh, keep the dogs off, would, could it be like hot peppers down uh, in the grass? You know, or I, I don't know if they, what repellents you can buy. They do sell repellents at the stores. I don't know. I buy a sign. I would talk to your sign neighbors. Dogs, <laughs> no. Okay. No, no dogs. I, you know, right. I, I don't know how to. That would be the way to remedy your problems. Get your neighbors to leash their dogs. You have to put up a fire hydrant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, when I moved here uh, nine years ago, I asked somebody what to get for my lawn. They said, well, uh, this stuff was de developed at NC State. It was called Southern Gold. It's a uh, fescue. And so I planted that. They said, I also recommend using this. Uh, stuff that comes in bags. It's a combination of topsoil and, and fertilizer as opposed to straw. And I have done that, but I don't know that it works. I mean, I, I, I keep seeding every year, you know, yeah. that's my story. I, I, I like doing that too, putting out compost to make sure that it's, it's um, in soil. And you do that when you, how often do you do that? Again, it, it's going to vary. I mean, some, some yards are just going to need renovation every year. Yeah, that would be mine. Yeah. I mean, my yard is very shady, so grass does not, does not like to grow in shade. So those areas are constantly in need of renovation. High traffic areas where it's compacted, those are going to be in constant need of renovation. So there, there's lots of different things that can cause you to have to decide. One other part of that. So I, last year, I, my lawn was killed by stuff that looked like I'm um, thought Bermuda grass, wild stuff. How do you get rid of that? How do you deal with that? How do you get rid of it? Right. I've tried both the flamethrower and the roundup. <laughs> yes, yeah. that stuff is also very tough. People yeah. call it wire grass. Yeah. Yeah, wire grass is very difficult to get rid of. Um, pulling it out, you know, just you have to constantly look at it. Throw everything out. I have got a very shady lawn with a lot of trees, very tall trees around it. And I'm struggling with an alternative, but one of the questions I have is, how much sun does cool season grass need? Um, you know, I don't know the exact number, but I would say probably six hours. Six hours. Okay, so if I have less than six hours, say I have four or five, I should really look at alternatives other than grass? If you're, if you're struggling, yeah, I think so. I mean, it's just an option, okay. unless you want to continue to struggle. <laughs> Cut down some of the trees. I've decided that's what we're going to have to do. We took down all the trees for Fran, and all the ones we left just got bigger and shadier, wow. and it's worse than it ever was before. <laughs> and, uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, the, the, the tulip tree's got to go. The leaves are so big, the sun just doesn't get through it and stuff like that. You know, I'm actually considering dwarf manda. I know that's crazy, but no, that's, that's, that was one of her photographs. Will it grow in the lower light? I think it does. Oh yeah, yeah. And it, it looks very green from the distance. It 
There, there's a yard here somewhere in Raleigh that's all dwarf mondo. It was featured in the paper one year, many years ago. It's pretty expensive. <laughs> Got to work on it. Multiply it's too, isn't it? Yeah, I don't know. I've had some that just naturally spread in my own places. So. My, my deer take the regular mondo grass and just crop it down to yeah, dwarf size. Yeah. It just doesn't look quite as pretty. Yeah. Do deer eat dwarf mondo? Is that right? No, I, regular mondo. I don't know about dwarf mondo. Uh, but they do eat regular mondo? Oh, yeah. Come see my yard. I'll show you. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't really have to do with uh, uh, lawns, but uh, mulching. This year, uh, I put down a, a bunch of uh, leaf mulch that the uh, county was selling. Great looking stuff. Yeah. Absolutely wonderful, and and definitely holds moisture. But somebody said the uh, it, it rots. It's going to cause you a problem uh, over and above what. Uh, uh, bark mulch or other things like that. Let's see why. Um, mm -hmm. Nor do I think it. <laughs> it's because it's got chopped up still grass in it. Huh? That? It's got chopped up still well, grass. Well, it, 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 it has weeds. Why be weeds? Well, probably, it does have weeds, of yeah. course. But that's why we use from them. But it com if it was composted and got hot enough, it should all have seeds. Yeah. Those, right. But if you've seen that where they where they do it, they have those huge piles and they're steaming. Those are hot. They're yeah. gonna get way hotter than you can get at home. Well, yeah. It looks it looks great. I've never yeah, had I don't, better I don't think it's just gonna add um, organic material to your soil. When I was younger, I used to go get bags and bags and put out that stuff. Yes. I have a, an area in my yard that for three three years now the moles are going crazy in there. <laughs> constant, constant tunneling with the moles. And um, so they're obviously going after, there must be grubs in there or they wouldn't be there, right? But so that, that is the case, but they also like earthworms. I know, they like worms too, but if they're focusing on this particular area, I think there's gotta be something besides the earthworms in there. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, um, and, and as a result of all the tunneling in there, there's no grass left. Um, or, or virtually none. Um, so there's a smattering of weeds here and there. Mm -hmm. um, what's the right time? I mean, I hate to use insecticides to kill the grubs, but what's the so, right time so to do that? So think for grubs that you can do without using an insecticide, there's uh, a product called milky spore disease. So it's a natural, it's a bacteria disease that they get. Does that affect all, scrub, all grubs or just certain uh, species? Nasty ones, I don't think it is. Um, I'm not aware, but I think it's mostly just targeted to me. Because what I was thinking is the reason that there's absolutely no grass left is I was thinking something was actually attacked. Sometimes some of those grubs were attacking the grass roots was what I was thinking. Well, isn't it um, voles that eat the grass roots no. and moles no, that eat the... Vol the voles will eat your expensive hosta roots oh, and your expensive it. aspidistra roots and everything that's expensive. But they will eat the grass roots. I don't have... I don't think the voles, no, the just, voles will leave voles a dog. Voles aren't really a yeah, problem in the grass. But, but you're, in general, you're right, right that, that right. voles are vegetarians and, right. and uh, moles are insectivores. But, uh, yeah. Or herbivores, I should use the right term. But, um, but yes, that, that's right. So get the milky spore. Milky spore. But doesn't that take several years mm -hmm. before it's effective? Yeah, and, you know. But and you then you can get, you know, if your neighbors aren't controlling the beetles and stuff, you get more grubs yeah. too. Yeah, the milky spore works real well. Does it? I, yeah, I, I've used it on the lawn areas. Okay. They, they kill the grass between the moles and the um, the uh, excuse me, the moles and the, grubs. and the grubs. The grass died, and so I got angry and put milky spore out a couple, three times that year. And it takes a year for the okay. bacteria to get into the soil and stop it. But now my grass my grass area is completely clean of all that. Oh, good. But the wood area that I didn't treat, they're in there. Well, that's where they live. And so that's right. So now I've got to, if I want to, if I want to move the beds back, I need to go back a little further into the woods with the milky spore. If you can almost see where it was applied, it was that good. Is there a right time of year to apply it? Well, it's on the bag. Okay. They recommend doing it uh, in, in Spring and again late yeah. summer. I would say probably you know temperature dependence, probably still a little cool right. down for the bacteria to be active. So yeah, you don't want to put it out there when it's the ground so dry that bacteria dies. How long 
comes at last because you know then I did that, did Milky's board for years and then quit. And then you know Well it's so, gonna be like the, once the grubs are gone, the bacteria's not gonna have anything. Oh so it doesn't <laughs> stay there in the in the store. Another question was you mentioned the free emergence or control of justice yeah. still grass and I've been doing that for years and um, I mean, I'm applying it three times in the spring, and so what, but what I've been told is that the pre-emergents that are available to us at the hardware store and so on to the homeowner are not effective against gold grass, and I need to hire a professional chemical company to come out to get the good I, stuff. Yeah, I have not heard that. I don't know what, that. I don't know that they have anything special. Because if you read the bags, none of the bags say they're effective against gold grass. I've got some nasty ones in the big box. See, I can I've only found one product. What? I've only found one product that actually called out still grass. Okay. And I found it listed on Amazon. Okay. And I'm sure it's available for the suppliers, but it's a really expensive concentrate. Okay. And it's like hundred dollars per <coughs> kind of stuff. Wow. Um, yeah. but I, I think it's, it, it's a real challenge. So that's basically you just have to keep at it, try to realize how much. All right, thank you.